to Chow, who, who works at MSIN at Monash with us. And um, I think Chow said already that he did his PhD in a clinical trial in, in uh, microbiome and he used a variety of imaging techniques. But spectroscopy, which is actually like the, the ugly duckling of imaging, the elephant man, if you like, uh, which we love, uh, very keen to push forward with it. Uh, he's going to talk a bit about that and see if he can convince you that this is good as well. Oh, sometimes it's a bit temperamental. Yeah, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the uh, spectroscopy, the beauties and the ugly. I know it's going to be a tough presentation because all the beautiful pictures have been taken by all the presenters. <laughs> and we will need the uh, spectroscopy, which is black and white, very dry things. It's like a, the dwarfs compare with the snow white, but actually these small creatures can tell us a little bit more secret about the brain. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief history of the spectroscopy and then some basics, then followed by the data, how to process the data and the location, etc. and wrap up. So as uh, a brief history of, about this magnetic resonance spectroscopy, MRIs. MRIs is like a one of the families of all the other MR technologies, which is originally from the uh, NMR uh, concepts, which is the, the, the first, uh, the start was uh, labeled by Professor Rabbi first uh, observed the magnetic resonance phenomenon. And in 1945, uh, Professor Block and uh, Purcells established, established a nuclear mag magnetic resonance spectroscopy and later on this technique transfer into spectroscopy, which is something to talk about today. And then in 1973, Professor Lauter produced the first NMR imaging using NMR technique and then this later on was transferred into the MR imaging uh, for, the medical, for the medical use. And uh, later on, we have the function MRI and the DTI uh, techniques later on, and then we have our Snow White. <laughs> so from this picture, we can see that uh, spectroscopy is at least uh, 28 years older than Snow White. Um, but spectroscopy was originally designed to do the quantitative measurements, so which is very uh, important for this technique, and uh, because spectroscopy was target, targeting all these metabolites, which is interesting for uh, some biomedical or biomedical models, so make it even pop, more and more popular recently. So, because this start beginning, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the physics of uh, uh, spectroscopy. Hope it don't get people boring. So, the story start with the magnetic M. So. Uh, we, we know that rotating charged particles, we, we can consider that as a magnetic bar. So let's take the uh, hydrogen proton, for example, and for my whole talk, when I'm talking about protons, it's the hydrogen protons, not the proton from other nuclei. So it is rotating this way, and we can consider it as a magnetic bar, which is pointing upwards. And if we consider the proteins in the tissues outside the scanners, uh, the direction of this small magnetic uh, bars can be randomly pointing everywhere. And if we put the tissues into the scanner, the uh, proteins will line up with the external magnetic field. So there are two states. If the direction is in the parallel direction with the external magnetic field, we call it low energetic state. And if it's in the empty direction, which is, uh, we call it high energetic state. So if it's so hard to understand, we can take as a we can consider other people. So if I consider the whole classroom as a teacher, and each of you is the protons, and my talk about physics is external magnetic field, and the number of you will be in the two status, the low energetic status, sleeping, and at high energetic status. Um, and the protein is similar like people, lazy, and my talk is like magnetic field, it's boring. So we find more sleeping people in the tissue rather than the end. Okay, so that's the first step of an MRI. The second step is, we call it excitation, so we call it wake up. 
So the wake up signal is actually an RF pulse, so it's a radio frequency pulse. Um, it only affects the sleeping people. And uh, it's a very unique frequency. So, for example, if we put in 1.5 Tesla scan, if we want to wake up a proton, uh, we need to give it an effort pulse of 63.855 megahertz, and only this frequency will work. So it's like a resonance, others won't work. So we have to carefully select this radio frequency so I can excite the proteins we want. And we give it to the excitations, and some of the people wake up. And once it wake up, we switch off the, the uh, wake up signals, and we come to the third uh, important phase, which is relaxation. Getting relaxed. And remember the person who just wake up, you want to go back to sleep. Why? Because of the external magnetic field, because of my talk. I'm still talking about physics. You wake up, <laughs> so still physics, let's go back to sleep. All right. So that means that he's transferred from a high energy state to a low energy state. In the meantime, he releases the powers to the surrounding. And if we use a uh, receive coil to pick up a signal, we, we got the free induction decay signal, which is produced by the relaxation. And we put that in the Fourier transform, and we got a peak in the frequency domain. So we got one peak in spectrum. And uh, we're only interested in those people who just uh, wake up. Why? Because though only those people will have the relaxation theory, and those relaxation will produce the FID signal, which is a late on transfer into the useful signals. So then when we talk about these protons, give you a rough idea, so there's only part of millions of the old proteins in the tissue, but it still ends up with billions of billions of proteins with an entirely little bit small part of the tissues. Okay, so now we finally come to spectroscopy. So how we get the spectroscopy? So the, the very, the, the, the most important concept in spectroscopy is the chemical shift. That means different proteins will do the relaxations in different way. Basically, means quicker or small or slower. So, like someone wake up and uh, fell asleep in three seconds, and someone wake up fell asleep in three minutes. And the the the, the things we did, um, and this process was purely was dependent on the magnetic field around it. Okay, just make it easy to understand. We think about methanol. Um, the carbon and oxygen, the new carbon and oxygen nuclear also have their own magnetic field on top of that, of the uh, external magnetic field. So then the hydrogens will have uh, different magnetic, local magnetic, magnetic field for each hydrogen proton. So those three of them share the same type of magnetic, uh, local magnetic field, and uh, they have a relatively longer excitation. Here, so it's considering that like, uh, these three people is under the air condition and the chill weather just make them stay awake a longer time. And uh, the, the blue one is in a different magnetic field, local magnetic field will give them a much quicker relaxation period. So for example, someone sitting in the sun is just getting to sleep very quickly. And uh, while they're doing this uh, relaxation Process, they will release the FID signals, which we can pick up using the receive coil. And after Fourier transform, we find shiftings on the uh, on the frequency domain, so we get two peaks. And the blue T peaks is indicating with the relatively faster relaxations, if you like, and the pink one is in indicating another one. So then we got this the shift on frequency domain, which is purely dependent on the relaxation period and which is dependent on where they're located on the molecule. So that's why we call it chemical shift. And another important uh, information from the spectroscopy is the area and the each peaks indicating the concentration of this type of proton. So the, if you look at that the pink Yeah, so the, the pink proteins is three times more than the blue one. So if you look at the areas and the pink peak is three times more than the blue. Uh, the pink air is, is bigger than the blue peak. And the second important, it's also very important concept, is the spin and spin coupling. 
It, that means the relaxation period is not only dependent on whether you're sitting in the sun or air condition, it also depends on your neighbor. That if all your neighbors fell asleep, you're more likely to fall asleep as well. So let's take ethanol for example. Uh, the same thing will have the chemical shift because the two carbons and the one oxygen will produce its own magnetic field and influence all the local magnetic field of protons. And they folks have three types of local magnetic field, the blue, green, and the red one. So if I do the same things, and we find the three peaks on the, uh, on the frequency domain. Okay, so the green one and the blue one are so close to each other, so they start to interact with each other. And the, the blue, yeah, so it's a contradict, so they interact with, with each other. And on the frequency domain, what you actually observe is this small splittings of the peaks. And then instead of you have one main peak, you have several peaks. And the black little red one is so far away with the other neighbors, so you don't get any interactions. So it's only one peak for the red peak. This is boring, but it's very important to, this is the basics of a mega press, which gives you the ability to detect something like GABA, so GSH, or separate the glutamine and glutamate. So let's give a comparisons of all MRI images and the MRI spectroscopy. The MRI is mainly focusing on the water and spectroscopy is on uh, metabolites. And MRI is mainly targeting uh, hydrogen proteins. In MRIs, you have the options to target other uh, nuclear. Uh, MRI is uh, have a very uh, big concentration in terms of the hydrogen because it's from water and the spectroscopy you look at something really uh, weak signal like a millimole uh, levels. You get a beautiful MRI image because of the spin density, relaxation of water and uh, you get the spectroscopy because of the chemical shift we just talked about. And the MRI you get beautiful and very fine structures, spectroscopy you're looking at a centimeter scale. And MRI, you can acquire the whole scan whole brain in second, spectroscopy you get minutes. And the outcome is obviously not as beautiful as MRI. But there are two types of spectroscopy. First is the single voxel spectroscopy, which is I'm going to talk about more later on. Um, so that means you select a region of interest which you, your hypothesis base and you place the voxel there you get a spectroscopy from that region. And the second one is the chemical shift imaging, uh, is that you get uh, you scan the whole plate and uh, separate it into each big voxels and uh, you can get spectroscopy for each voxels. As you can imagine, CSI is going to take more time, but of course the trade-off is to get a uh, standardized ratio. So data processing. Okay, so what is the signal really looks like? So it looks like that. So what's this? What is this big one? Is actually the water. Why? Because the water is hundreds of millions more concentrated than the metabolites in the brain tissue. And remember, the areas under the peak is indicating the concentration. So we have this huge, big Snow White, uh, which is on top of our. So you can't really see the dwarf is hiding under the skirt of the Snow White. So the first thing we want to do is to get rid of uh, Snow White. So we will apply the water suppressions and then we can see our seven little bodies here. And so this is, I pick up the seven major ones. So there were four big brothers, which is DNA, collins, creatines, and uh, I call it MI. And then some little one lactate, and there's a twin brother, it's the glutamate and the glutamine. So the NNA is this one, this resonance at 2.02 ppm, and it's usually the markers of, uh, of neural health. And the second one is choline, uh, which call, I call it the bad, because the increase of choline always indicating the uh, active tumor. And the third one is creatine, usually stable, so it always usually, usually serves as a denominator of creatine and choline. So the fourth one is IMI, is used as uh, glial cells markers. And the lactate is sometimes it's hard to detect in the healthy subjects, but uh, the increase of these markers usually indicate uh, uh, necro, ne 
necrosis and the, the glutamate and the glutamine is always hard, usually hard to distinguish and usually labeled as GRX in the reference. Okay, so to process data, first the straightaway thing is you can usually always get the signals on the MR console. So the radiographer will help you to process the data and tell you how big are all these uh, the, the, the peaks. Um, yeah, that's the, the, the signal of the peaks. And the second one is LC models. It's um, a very popular, it's a popular processing tool, but it's, um, it's charged and it's not, not cheap. And the Tarquin is quite similar like the LC model, but just get a little bit less technical support. The good thing is free. And GMRUI is more powerful. It uh, not only processes the spectroscopy, but also NMR. So you, when you set up GMR, GMRUI, will need someone knowing to set up for you. So talking about the uh, data quantification, which is we uh, want to measure how big our little goals are. So the first one we usually use is a relatively value. So because quantum is uh, stable, so usually as a denominator. So in your publication, you can just talking about NNA on quantum or uh, Collins on quantum. Usually should be fine. And uh, but quantum sometimes not always stable. So that's the come to the second uh, thing is the absolute value, which is calculate the actual concentration uh, at the region of interest in the peak and uh, basically use water intensity as the denominator. And uh, it is more robust than the relatively value, as you mentioned, but they need something extra. So for example, they need to, to, to acquire extra water intensity, which is usually included for GE scanner, but there's always a couple of seconds you can put it in. And the second one is you probably need to calculate the fractions of CSF, if you're using the traditional way, the relapse arbitrary, you're probably looking at 10 minutes. But I have some script to run it to get a fraction of CSF using the T1 image you get and your spectroscopy. So it can save you some money and time. And uh, it's also important because not only to doing the absolute quantification, but when you're doing other type of uh, post-processing, you really want to get rid of the partial volume defect of the box you choose. So that is, this is very important for all types of uh, signal processing, uh, for MRI spectroscopy processing. So my script is now working with uh, Philip and the Siemens scanner and G scanner is on the way. I'm happy to uh, share a script with you if you want to process the data and uh, it's going to be uh, public once everything is uh, finished. Okay, so that's all about technical. Let's talk about the, uh, uh, applications of MRI spectroscopy. The uh, traditional application of spectroscopy is in brain tumor. So first is because spectroscopy can help to distinguish between uh, assesses and uh, glioma. So for example here you see the, uh, a huge peak of coatings for this, uh, this glioma uh, which I said is the bad, is indicating the active tumors. And uh, for the Abscesses, uh, we don't have this, uh, uh, there's no uh, colleagues, but there's a big lactate which indicates the, the, uh, the necrosis. And the second big use is to MRI can help to distinguish between the radiation necrosis and the tumor recurrence. So, this is the, uh, a patient with a history of and a plastic astrocytoma treated with surgery and radiation. So the, <coughs> the increase of is indicating that's actually a tumor recurrence. So when we come to the cognitive neuroscience research, uh, the NNA is usually to be the most interesting things because the high concentration of NNA was always associated with higher uh, uh, intelligence as well as during the situation of conflicts indicating with the better task performance. So this is the pro this is a project using those task country MRI and spectroscopy is looking at what's the roles of uh, NNA uh, in 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 the uh, uh, in this doing this task. So, so people is doing uh, the the subjects is doing the task into scanners and all these 
yellow dots indicating the activations of an anterior cingulate which is introduced by this task. And the blue box is the, the region of interest of spectroscopies where they put in and we can calculate the uh, uh, NMA of uh, that region and uh, by doing this structure equation modeling so we can find this the NMA at this region and at also anterior cingulate regions and linked with the intelligence which is further associated with the activations of these regions as well as the, uh, the performance of the task. Um, it, there also can be, spectroscopy can also be used in psych, psych, psychotic disorders. Um, these papers find the decrease of NMA for schizophrenia subjects at dorsal and the rostral cingulate cortex on both hemispheres, and it's probably imply, it's implying the neural loss or dysfunctions are at these regions. And the similar results was find at the NMA concentration at the temporal lobe. So when we're comparing the ultra high risk psychosis with the healthy subjects we find a decrease of NMA concentration on these regions. Uh, for Alzheimer's disease, uh, also find the decrease of NMA and uh, multiple regions, as well as importantly for Alzheimer's, you, have also, you also find this increase of MI. Um, so usually the uh, NMA on MI is uh, well markers for Alzheimer's disease in terms of MR spectroscopy. So for cannabis users, we also find this a global decrease of uh, NNAs of multiple regions for the cannabis users. And MR spectroscopies can also be used in deep depressions um, or other like Austin uh, kind of disease study. And the more application, so we just talked the application I just talked about is one of the seven dwarfs, like NNA or printing or MI, but it's actually some other little creatures is under those seven uh, dwarfs, like uh, GABA, like glute signs, and uh, to separate the twins, glutamate and glutamide is very important as well. And all this can be done by using the uh, Megapress uh, sequence, which is going to be established on our scan. And it's more important, interestingly, is uh, uh, you can use this MR spectroscopy to target in the neural uh, neurogenesis, and uh, that is part of my PhD work involved. Uh, that's how I got this, I didn't have any results to share with you at the moment, what we do in the future. Um, so let me conclude with about spectroscopy. So. Uh, MRS is uh, all about powerful MRI tools to uh, quantify the metabolites and the new application of spectroscopy will allow us to quantify the other weak signals. Um, however, the challenge of MR spectroscopy is exit. First is so we might introduce a false discovery rate when the signal noise is, rate is low. So if we look at all this weak peak, we could like, force discover some of the results. Yeah, over more of the, the noise. And second, we need to predefine the regions based on the prior knowledge. That means before you start a scan, you have to think about your question list and just predefine the regions. And then you have to choose carefully when you do the data processing. And of course, the sequence is also, um, also the data sample of the sequence is as complex as other types of sequence. So set up the sequence correctly before you press the red button. <laughs> Should never press the right button. <laughs> 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 okay, so that's all my talk and uh, any questions? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, any questions about spectroscopy or Walt Disney? <laughs> You're welcome. I have a relatively ignorant question. The, the final paper you showed was looking at region, I think, and how, what's the spatial resolution, I mean, is it a similar kind of thing to other imaging techniques where they just, I mean, how do they isolate the area? Uh, you mean the spectroscopy on the campus? Yeah. Oh, yeah, spectroscopy, as I said, the, the spatial resolution is only centimeters, so you use the, 
the bad. So the question is use the structure image to find where the hippocampus it is, and you just pl place the whole big box. Oh, okay, so it's the same thing, kind of this. Yeah, overlap on that on that on that uh, hippocampus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you you, you can't see the shape, but you get the the spectroscopy within that box. Which if you put on the hippocampus, mm -hmm. that's from seeing hippocampus. It's an average of that somewhere like across the entire section, area. the area that it's yeah. placed, and it's yeah. also an average across intracellular and extracellular as well. So if you're looking at something like glutamate, glutamine, um, it's kind of a combination of the whole of everything, of everything mm -hmm. rather than separating out yeah. intra versus into well, glutamate, glutamine can, but you need better techniques. But well, you're right, it's exactly that function where you require structural for using that as a template to put it Structural is any image you carry on the other structure. Yeah. Did you have a question? I was actually going to ask about spatial resolution. So, I mean, how small can you be a box? Um, I think ideally, 2 cm by 2 cm by 2 cm give you a decent spectroscope. You can push it as small as you can, but you really push the limit of they're doing the shimmings of the, the scanners and also if it's too small you get very less uh, signal to sample as I talked about they also you're talking about something like millimore per liter so if you think like one million, one centimeter by cent one centimeter I think you it's already, I think that would be Can you compensate with increased acquisition time? Uh, yes of course but uh, like 128 Average will cost about uh, five minutes, and if you double that, you only have improved, but uh, theoretically improved at uh, 1.7 better signal noise ratio, and uh, that will double your time, about so 10 minutes. And if you scan too long, the surface is moving by any chance, you introduce the moving artifacts, which is you don't want to have that. So increasing your volume also increases your sensitivity to all the environmental things that might be going on. <laughs> You know, whether there's a blood vessel or more gray matter or more, more white matter, each of those components obviously influence the metabolite, so you really amplify that effect. Right. So you've got to control that back. But then you're perhaps bridging across some kind of region as well as you, as you increase. So this is a balance, eh? Uh, <clears throat> we use the standard sending signals for you know, is, do you get much trouble with shim? Do you use man do you have to do you find you have to do manual shim as opposed to look at shim? I was looking at sort of shim with the negative sequence or something for the sanitaries with that. Um I haven't do mega press on our so for the traditional sequence I I think all the mega shimmings will do the work. And the I have tried to scan some mega press sequence on the trial scanners in Swinburne University and they use uh, the reader offer is doing very good shaving. He's doing the manual shaving, and uh, we get some of the signals from Phantom. Yeah. And on your scanner as well, I guess, depending on how good your magnet is. Yeah, so probably the uh, probably the angle shape the vapors. Yeah, probably the mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So. Michael? I might answer my question. So in terms of when you look at neurotransmitter concentrations, um, if you're looking at just a box, are you getting just sort of all the neurotransmitter concentration in there? So is it like any differentiation between like whether it's synaptic, extrasynaptic? Um, it's just uh, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, just everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah, I mean again with glutamate glutamate, obviously you, if you can separate the peaks. One is intracellular, one is extracellular. Yeah. Beyond that, it's, it's not really possible. Yeah. And what about the non proton type spectroscopies? Is it phosphorus ones? Ah, yeah, that will. I think some of the phosphorus spectroscopies can easily pick up GABA signal, so it de depends on the, the molecule that you're interested in, whether they have some uh, uh, interest in. Shape, so you can choose the another type of the uh, sorry res uh, resonance the spectroscopy technique. But usually, if you want to choose another one, you have to buy the specific coil from that type of nuclear. So it's usually extra cost, uh, extra cost of your experiment. The signal goes down quite a lot as well. Uh, 
uh, yes, of course, the concentrations. So you divide the wheel out of color? Uh, uh, yeah, I see the color. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right, we might uh, go to the next one. Thank you, Jack. Yeah.